uh, during the same year. Uh, but then, of course, uh, child labor went on surreptitiously and people had to fight conscientious people, journalists and writers like Elizabeth Barrett Browning had to fight uh, in order to really banish it from England. And then, of course, there was a very famous poor law in 1834. Uh, what did the poor law do? The poor law decided, I mean, we will uh, go into the poor law in more detail when we deal with gender class race. But the poor law decided that those people who had, uh, those poor people who had almost no uh, way to earn anything honestly, uh, which means they were out of employment or unable to work, unfit to work, they will be taken into places called the workhouses, where they will be supported by the government. Uh, I mean, of course, uh, the very uh, sick people could not work, so they had to survive on a meager amount of food supplied in the workhouses. And other people who were good enough to work, of course, whether you are good enough to work or not will be decided by the authorities of the workhouse themselves. Uh, so it might be that you are 78 years old and quite infirm, but since the workhouse authority will brand you as good enough for active work, and it very frequently happened. Uh, so people who are able to work, they were being made to toil in jobs like breaking stones and then uh, separating oakum. I mean, uh, oakum will be used in making big ropes needed for hauling in ships and all. So very back-breaking kind of work uh, they had to do and the kind of food, food uh, supplied in the workhouses were not good at all. I mean, we will see it when we discuss Oliver Twist and all later. Uh, so anyway, the poor law happened during this period. And then, uh, I mean, uh, what... Uh, is important is that i mean since it is this age of reform and you will see that uh, the writers and the comment and the social commentators they are taking an active part in bringing these issues uh, in their literature as well i mean when you read early and mid victorian literature you will see all these things being discussed in the novels themselves i mean if you read novels by charles dickens almost all his novels are about one or more decisions of the liberal government. Of course, Dickens himself was not a supporter of the liberal government. He, uh, like his uh, kind of mentor, Thomas Carlyle, he did not believe in the liberal uh, way of doing things. Uh, but uh, the very uh, fact that he was dealing with these issues, I mean, when he deals uh, with the workhouse in Oliver Twist, he deals with the chancery in bleak house he deals with the utilitarian way of doing things and the educational system in hard times so the very fact that he was talking about all these things and when you read a novel like george Eliot's middle march i mean even there you can see that she is actively commenting on uh, the way of uh, the kind of uh, administration they deal out in the villages and the corruption of the people there and how people are denied chances. I mean, this very idea that uh, people being denied their chances should be talked about in the novels. Uh, it becomes possible only because the liberal government is ruling. Uh, it is actively encouraged in the order of the day. And, uh, I mean, funnily enough, when you look at the colonies, especially in our country, it's very kind of, uh, I mean, it's interesting to note that there is a lot of reform happening in our countries as well. I mean, uh, all those landmark decisions being taken, uh, let's say banning the Sati system and then uh, the opening of the institutions, the educational institutions, the debate between the Orientalists and the Occidentalists, and uh, then Macaulay's minute where he says that, uh, of course, the natives need Occidental education. Uh, these kind of landmark decisions are all being taken during this same period. Uh, and then the setting up of the universities of Calcutta and elsewhere. Uh, all these things are actually happening during this period. So reform measures and reform activities are being uh, carried out uh, in the colonies as well. Uh, and it is the same kind of government which is uh, passing these bills. So we must keep this in mind. 
so so much for social reform and then of course the matter of education i mean uh, uh, talking about education uh, this was probably the first time when the english government seriously started about thinking education education became compulsory up to an age of uh, 12 uh, for everyone and the government uh, took upon themselves the task to provide education as much as possible to as much uh, as large portions of society as possible there were three kind of educational institutions available uh, i am going to start with the lowest one uh, the first was the ragged schools and the ragged schools uh, the concept of ragged school was uh, begun by uh, individual people like there was a uh, a popular in london street street named john pounds he is a pretty famous man he said to have begun the concept of ragged school quite single handedly he had a kind of uh, he had an invalid nephew and uh, the nephew had no one to play with so in order to provide uh, his nephew some people to talk to he used to invite uh, street urchins and boys uh, uh, and he used to make them sit and uh, hear lessons from him I mean uh, the story of John Pounds finds the place in Chukumar Rachana Samagra I don't know how many of you have actually read it it uh, one of his essays in Shondesh is about John Pounds uh, and uh, there Chukumar says that the thing he used to uh, kind of uh, charm the boys to come and sit and hear to him was uh, potato chips uh, those were generally used as uh, the uh, the things which will them lure them to come and listen to him and then he almost single handedly found a kind of uh, small school where he had some 30 odd uh, boys from the lowest rung of the english society coming and listening to him so that is where the concept of ragged school started and quickly it became quite a rage in london so then you have ragged schools which had as uh, much as uh, 10000 students uh, so these were of course uh, in the parish uh, of them of course i mean uh, only a uh, acha 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 push uh, but 1000 uh, students read and then there used to be uh, church schools which the church uh, will run as a kind of supplementary institution uh, besides giving religious lessons to people and what was perhaps the most important educational institution and the most impactful was the public schools the public schools were of course for uh, the well to do people them public schools but they are not actually they were not actually for uh, the general public you had to come from either uh, the aristocracy or the upper middle class in order to read in these schools um, and then of course middle class boys began to be taken in and it is this public school which we see dealt in um, numerous novels uh, of this period of course uh, the very uh, the most famous work is thomas hughes's tom brown school days the school which it is uh, based on was run by matthew arnold's father thomas arnold and it was named the rugby school uh, and you can find the kind of life they led there uh, what did uh, the public schools uh, do i mean do they did they impart very good quality education the answer will be no because uh, imparting uh, let's say intellectual education of the highest quality did not seem to be their priority uh, the public schools practiced a kind of muscular christianity i mean the philosophy was known as muscular christianity where the development of the soul was regarded as important as the development of the body so besides getting literature lessons philosophy lessons and all besides reading the classics they will also be mandatorily taught to play outdoor games like football and cricket and let's say here that uh, the kind of employment most of these public school uh, pass outs took was serving the empire so it kind of the kind of outdoor games they came in very handy in this case as well i mean i always think 
cricket for that matter uh, it was a game which kind of made them ready for the colonial service it was almost a kind of uh, i mean uh, they were made to do the same things which they will be uh, made to do uh, in a broader scope during the colonial service i mean that's how uh, cricket back then was right i mean when you went when you uh, went to the colonies what did you have to do i mean uh, just think like this you had to stand or roam uh, on foot or on horseback whatever for long periods under the hot sun which was not there in england that much uh, so uh, that was something which cricket made you ready for because uh, that's what you actually do when you are fielding or even batting or bowling for that matter and then of course there is a strong sense of discipline because uh, in cricket you really uh, have no option but to listen to the captain and the umpire right i mean that is the final say so uh cricket was believed to uh, build a strong moral character from the very beginning uh, from uh, in the students i mean the uh, it kind of uh, built a, a kind of uh, mentality where you had no option but to listen to the authority uh, and uh, probably that is why you see poems being written during this period like uh, i mean when uh, gray writes like uh, when people say things like the battle of waterloo was actually won in the fields of eton and harrow what are they actually saying they're referring to these games i mean it is the same sense of discipline which was uh, which grew as a result of these games in the fields of eton and harrow when I mean, of course eton and harrow were very famous public schools back then uh, it is the same discipline that helped the english army to win the battle of waterloo so uh, and then of course football i mean uh, football people now know as a kind of working class game but football initially started as a game of the aristocrats and it was only around uh, 1870s uh, that uh, working class clubs uh, began to make it big in the fa cup which is the oldest football tournament uh, and you will find mentions being made of football and cricket in thomas hughes's tom brown school days and then of course you have dickens says uh, david copperfield where you have uh, the monitoring system where uh, the i mean uh, the kind of uh, customs like uh, choosing younger uh, yeah, choosing older boys as prefects and wardens uh, there is a lad called steerforth in david copperfield and these wardens or prefects sometimes used to be uh, very uh, let's say uh, very bad they used to torture the young students which you can both see in tom brown school days and in david copperfield uh, and then of course uh, there was this huge kind of controversy regarding uh, the idea of utilitarian education where uh, they believed in i mean of course you people know these things since you have hard times in your syllabus uh, there was this uh, argument regarding uh, teaching in a way so that there is maximum good for the maximum number of people so utilitarian education believed in stuffing the people pupils with as much information as possible and of course dickens regarded it as a kind of lifeless mechanical sort of education so he virulently criticized it in hard times uh, where we see the, that this kind of a teaching is being compared to uh, i mean uh, the the pupils are being compared to pitchers where uh, the knowledge is like literally stuffed down their throats uh, so and, and then we come to the issue of uh, female education of course there were female schools uh, i mean the most famous mention of a female uh, boarding school uh, is made in charlotte bronte's jane eyre where uh, she talks about uh, bronte talks about the lowood school and the lowood school is actually based on a real boarding school where charlotte emily and their elder sisters uh, had to go and all those uh, and uh, she does not really paint a very sweet picture of the lowood school uh the school was situated in a very unhealthy place and the students used to catch typhoid and other diseases there the food was horrible and of course real cases of typhus fever happened in uh, the boarding school uh, emily and charlotte went uh, and then the girl helen burns dies uh, in jane eyre so the girl helen burns may be based on uh, elizabeth uh, charlotte bronte's cousin who actually died because of typhus fever in the school uh, and 
then of course later on in the Victorian period, uh, colleges started to be built for uh, young women. Uh, I mean, there were working women's colleges. And then, uh, so uh, when we come to the end of the Victorian period, I mean, during the late Victorian period, when Thomas Hardy is writing novels, you can see Sue Bridehead going to college. And this whole idea of the new woman, it had a lot to do with the women getting higher education during the later part of the Victorian period. And the concept of the new woman, of course, will be dealt later when we come to the uh, gender class race section. So, uh, so much for education and then of course something related to education was science uh, the advancement of science has been much talked about i mean it is one of the issues which is frequently talked about when we talk about the victorian period i mean uh, I mean, this is not to say that science was not uh, taught uh, before the Victorian period. Science has been steadily uh, gaining importance uh, since the 18th century, if not the 16th century itself. I mean, why is the 16th century now called the early modern period? It is because uh, a spirit of inquiry and a spirit of, uh, let's say, rational thinking has been steadily gaining ground from the 16th century itself. It was there, the germs of rational thinking was very much there uh, in the renaissance philosophy so uh, but what happened during till the 18th century was that science seemed to be a pursuit of the rich a very small section of the society it seemed to be the a kind of uh, let's say um, a kind of off time pursuit for rich people who had uh, the capital to build their own laboratories and perform experiments privately there i mean uh, all all kinds of scientists which you read about during your uh, the earliest classes of physical science in class 7 and all think about those scientists i mean people like uh, let's say jb priestley then uh, robert boyle then humphrey davy and most importantly isaac newton all these 18th century people they were very rich they came from the landed gentry and they had that capital uh, to build their own laboratories and perform experiments there. I mean, Boyle's uh, uh, Boiler Gases Should Throw, Davis Safety Lamp. Uh, and even if uh, when you read. Uh, let's say novels like middle march in the victorian period i mean you see george Eliot still writing about those people uh, in rural areas there are still those kinds of people when lidgate comes he's of course a very scientifically minded man who has uh, who has uh, like uh, read in quality institutions in england and uh, Then in Paris, uh, and when he comes, he finds that in uh, the village, uh, uh, scientific pursuits are still being followed by these kinds of uh, status quo people, a handful of people who perceive it more as a kind of a laser uh, activity than an active quest for knowledge, let's say. So uh, this trend was still there in the Victorian period in the rural areas, but a trend was noticeable that uh, it was the government itself which took an active part in imparting scientific knowledge uh, in larger to expand scientific activities from these handful of landed gentry to the middle classes and uh, I mean select uh, within the, with some reservations to the working classes as well i mean you see that uh, what uh, developed was a kind of a culture where uh, discussions about science becomes possible there are a lot of journals cheaply uh, cheaply available journals where uh, the latest scientific experiments are being talked about in easy languages it was not like the journal of the royal society which was a kind of status symbol which was not really meant for uh, the common people and there are uh, easily available journals which even the middle classes and lower middle classes could buy, which will give them an idea about what was going on in the latest scientific experiments of the period, so that they can become a part of the scientific culture developing during this period. 
and then of course the government has started funding experiments more importantly uh, besides private funding the government itself has started funding experiments and experimental voyages i mean darwin himself received uh, government funding uh, i mean darwin changed the rules of the game right we are going to come to that later and then what the the british government also did was and there were associations associations like baas the british association of advancement of sciences which used to hold yearly conventions and the conventions were deliberately held in provincial towns like manchester like york uh, and because what was the aim the aim was to move away from the oxbridge circle i mean oxford and cambridge uh, to move away from london and impart a scientific spirit uh, among the so called rural people as well the so called marginal people as well um, and then of course the crisis in faith i mean uh, one of the most talked about aspects of the victorian society and literature uh, how did it begin i mean it began from the works of people like charles edward lyell when lyell wrote uh, principles of geology what he claimed was that uh, it was something completely opposite to what the bible had said he claimed that the world is much older than what the bible claims uh, and uh, the world was not really built in six days and then god took rest for one day which is uh, the sunday actually uh the world was built in stages and then uh, it was not really as easy as let there be light and then everything came into being life came on this earth in various stages and uh, in various forms and then life has come and then uh, there has been uh, several uh, cataclysmic events which had rubbed away any sign of life from the face of the earth again and again uh, extinction has happened a number of times and then after repeated uh, coming of life and then subsequent extinctions we have arrived at the present stage of flora and fauna i mean this itself was a great blow to what the chart said to what the bible said but the problem was that lyell had proofs and the proofs came in uh, the form of fossils i mean he said that well i have uh, these proofs that there used to be uh, other kinds of animals like the archaeopteryx like the pterodactyl uh, like uh, so i have these proofs so but, but what about the bible because the bible didn't have that kind of concrete answers uh, and then of course came charles darwin to make matters worse he he went i mean we know he made a journey to the galapagos islands uh, on the ship hms beagle I mean, then he wrote a book called *The Voyage of the Beagle*. Uh, so, and then the kind of experiments he made there, he discovered his origin of species and natural selection, all these kinds of theories. Of course, Lamarck had been working on them uh, before. And then he published *Origin of Species* and then *The Descent of Man*, where he said that uh, the there is a kind of continuous struggle for existence and uh, those who are unable to adapt are wiped away from the face of the earth it is only the strongest who remain and uh, that is how people have uh, that is how things have evolved uh, so he kind of discovered the concept of evolution and then in the descent of man he made the claim that man has actually descended from monkey so it was kind of a big blow for people because uh, right from uh, the advent of christianity the people have been thinking that man is made in the image of man so uh, from the image of man to the image of monkey is quite a big blow indeed so uh, people refuse to believe it and uh, now we cannot even imagine the kind of tremendous impact which darwin's uh, which darwin's words had i mean uh, there there are books now being written about the complete impact of darwin on victorian literature i mean this is a kind of uh, this is an area of research which is still going on but uh, there are of course uh, some immediate impacts which we can talk about for example tennyson i mean if you read tennyson's in memoriam it begins as uh, a kind of uh, elegy uh, for the death of his friend arthur henry hallam but then quickly it becomes something much more than that i mean in in memoriam tennyson seems to be a man uh, who is uh, i mean he himself says that i'm crying in the wilderness because he seems to be that uh, the typical educated man of the victorian period whose whole scheme of things had gone haywire due to this recent scientific findings i mean 
their entire uh, order of things had gone helter skelter they had a specific uh, idea about the world they had a specific idea about god they used to think that god was the benevolent uh, old man up in the sky protecting us against all odds but then when these people claimed that uh, life has been uh, i mean wiped away from the face of the earth a number of times the first question there was was that was there any god uh because if god is really benevolent if there is a benevolent god then would he have let that happen uh, i mean christianity tells people that if you sin then you die but what sin did the dinosaurs have uh, that they had to be wiped away from the face of the earth like this so what was the benevolent god doing then and then again the question if there was really a supreme power was he really benevolent and uh, this I, this whole idea of uh humans animals living organisms living in happiness in order uh, it kind of uh, broke down uh, and what darwin put in its stead was a world where organisms were ceaselessly fighting it was a violent world uh, for uh, i mean with the struggle for survival so you see tennyson making uh, i mean mention of the clawed tiger the eagle i mean uh, the violent animals because the post darwinian world is a violent world to think about and then he of course makes mention of the ape who darwin has of course said is the forefather of man so it is a new kind of world which darwin's and lyell's experiments have opened up and then and then of course uh, the crisis of faith has been beautifully talked about in matthew arnold's poem dover beach where he says that uh, the sea of faith uh, has now receded and what is there in its stead naked shingles and people seem to be in doubt because so far they had been believing in the idea of the benevolent god and what not but now they seem to be in doubt i mean even if we and uh, then he uh, ends the poem with ignorant armies clashing by night so uh, then comes the idea of religion i mean when you uh, uh, take a look at what was happening during uh, what was happening in the religious circles i mean it seemed to be like this it, there was a clash uh, a clash as uh, let's say uh, unsure as the peloponnesian war which uh, arnold talks about i mean even even in uh, the churches there were a lot of divisions i mean there were new uh, sects uh, breaking away from the anglican church sects like the dissenters and the anglican church itself was uh, beginning to uh, become like the catholic church as uh, suggested by the oxford movement so the evangelicals had a very much problem with that and then there were men like holyok who founded the secularist movement and the secularists uh, they kind of uh, started saying that uh, why do we have to take the bible as unquestionable what about a rational reading of the bible and holyok had to go to jail for such kind of words for saying such kind of things but he never uh, turned back on his ideals i mean his own daughter uh, fell sick and died when he was in jail but still he refused to back down so it was obvious that something else was happening i mean even people in religion had started uh, to voice their questions i mean which uh, i mean uh, they had been nursing uh, discontents and questions which the new scientific uh, discoveries uh, have let's say made even more uh, powerful the questions and uh, then of course you uh, see that uh, well darwinism had another angle which we need to talk about here darwinism also provided a kind of ground for uh, let's say racial thinking racist thinking because uh, then the racist people could say that look that was what we were talking about i mean there's non european races and uh, the kind of life forms you find in the colonies they are uh, like less evolved so they can be wiped out of the earth so simply because it's the law of evolution right the less fit should uh, vanish away from the earth so then you have uh, let's say a kind of uh, a kind of logic a kind of validation for what you are doing to the native americans the australian aboriginals the new zealand uh, the maori people or even the dodo bird uh, for that matter Uh, and uh, patrick brantlinger has a book uh, the vanishing races where he talks about uh, post darwinian uh, during this period there were some theorists who genuinely believed that uh, these the africans and the aboriginals uh, they will 
slowly, I mean, become extinct because they simply don't deserve to inherit this earth. They are less evolved species. It's only the more evolved Anglo-Saxon who will remain. Uh, so, and then uh, you see uh, that among the, I mean, if we take a broad look at the English people, there are three groups uh, during this period. First, there are the believers who are, uh, the believers are mostly, let's say, uh, the uneducated people uh, and also some writers as well people who continued to believe in the idea of the benevolent god people like let's say charles dickens he was very much a liberal christian uh, gm hopkins of course swerved i mean he had some problems with god which is obvious from his poems but ultimately he believed in god uh, and then uh, there are people who there are some people who greatly question the very idea of God. I mean, uh, when you read right, uh, when you read works by Oscar Wilde and such, you will find sometimes he is deliberately questioning that whether there is any God or such things. Uh, and then, of course, there are the agnostics who are very important, influential um, men of uh, men and women of letters. I mean, people like say George Eliot. Uh, the agnostics, the word comes from. I mean, gnosis is of course to know. I mean, knowledge. So agnostic means to not know, to not know for sure that is these people they kind of uh, when they wrote uh, their underlying philosophy of their work seemed to say something like well we do not know that whether i mean we believe in something called a supreme power but we don't really know what the nature of the supreme power is is it benevolent or is it uh, something else i mean George Eliot believed in, I mean, um, their idea of the supreme power was not similar to the idea of a Christian God. George Eliot, for example, believed that there is a supreme power who, but she did not believe in, uh, I mean, she did not that much believe in the concept of the afterlife. She, see, uh, she said that uh, this supreme power meets out punishments and rewards in this life itself. So if you read uh, books like Adam Bede or even Middlemarch or even, uh, let's say, Mill on the Floors, I mean, Adam Bede, uh, I mean, the punishment of adultery comes in uh, a single life itself. And then, of course, there is Thomas Hardy. Hardy uh, believed that, of course, there is a power, but according to him, that power or fate, it takes pleasure in tormenting man. I mean, instead of helping people, it takes pleasure in suddenly intervening and making things problematic. I mean, if you read Hardy's works, and there are, again and again, there are such moments where fate intervenes and changes uh, a kind of, uh, changes a peaceful scene into an immediate tragedy. I mean, the very moment when Gabriel Oak loses all his ship, by an unlucky uh, stroke of fortune, that night he forgot to close the pen and the, the gate of his sheep pen. That was the night when uh, it was uh, a new moon night, so there was no light in the sky. And it was again a night when his sheep dog has fallen asleep. So all his sheep merrily came out of the pen. And again, there was, there was a kind of a steep... Uh, kind of hollow nearby where all the sheep then slipped away so overnight he was reduced from let's say a rich farmer to a pauper it's a typical hardy situation the kind of things uh, happens in test of the devils as well i mean uh, i mean what would happen if uh, angel claire had really made an approach to Tess quite early on in the novel. She would never have met Alec then. And even then when Tess writes that letter to Angel Claire, and the letter falls, the letter slips inside the carpet and uh, Angel never sees the letter. So when Tess is getting married to Angel, Tess thinks that Angel knows about her past history with Alec. But Angel has never even come across the later ones. So it's a kind of, uh, it's a kind of, let's say, typical uh, Hardian situation. And then again, the same thing happens in uh, Mayor of Castlebridge. I mean, the very moment when Henchard, uh, being intoxicated, he offers to sell his wife, a willing buyer appears, uh, Colonel Newsom, uh, let's say, um, uh, the sailor Newsom. So uh, it is always like that in Hardy. He believes that there is a power, there is something else at play, but it's not a benevolent God. It is rather something which takes uh, pleasure in spoiling things for people. Uh, so so, uh, so uh, that is, uh, I mean, so much for religion. And then we come to gender, class, race, which are, of course, intertwined with each other. 
I mean, the Victorian idea of gender was very much patriarchal. I mean, the Victorians are infamously patriarchal. I mean, if you read, I mean, the lines from Tennyson's The Princess, I mean, uh, man for the field and woman for the hearth, man for the sword and for the needle she, man for the head and woman for the heart, man to command and woman to obey. It is kind of uh, pretty obvious that what kind of gender roles were being assigned. Uh, and... Uh, and then you see people like John Ruskin uh, writing uh, in his books, S.M. and Lilies in uh, Of Queen's Gardens. Uh, uh, the same thing. Uh, women should remain in home. The men are the ones who should go outside. And they are the stronger uh, ones. I mean, the ideal Victorian man was supposed to be, let's say, courageous, uh, physically strong. He should be the provider of the family. He should earn bread for the family by the sweat of his brow. He should go outside and he also uh, should not be too much pervious to emotions. So that is where the idea of the stiff Victorian upper lip comes. Uh, the ideal Victorian man should have a stiff upper lip. I mean, he should not be uh, given away to too much sorrow or happiness. I mean, when you smile or when you cry, it is your upper lip which gets curved, first of all, right? So the Victorian man must have a stiff upper lip. It must not curve either too much in smile or too much in sorrow, let's say. Uh, and of course, the ideal Victorian woman should be sweet tempered, should be uh, sacrificing, uh, should be tame. She should remain in home and take care of the family. She should be the keeper of culture and the keeper of, uh, let's say, uh, the, the keeper of morality in the house. But of course, women were uh, kind of uh, fighting against such kind of uh, ideas. I mean, uh, in America, they had been fighting for, uh, they had been fighting. Uh, for, uh, let's say, suffrage and all. And, uh, I mean, uh, if we see uh, that... If we see uh, the, the women... Uh, writing during the romantic period when you write uh, when you uh, read works like vindication of the rights of women by mary wollstonecraft she seems to say that all we need is an equal recognition from man uh, an equal recognition of our labor that we also work that is the only thing she seems to be wanting uh, somebody has a uh, uh, please put off your mic yes. Yes. Uh, yes. You also? Okay. So, uh, what uh, most of craft seems to be saying is that please recognize that we also work hard. Uh, that is the only thing she seems to be saying. But when you come to the Victorian period and see, uh, you see people like Charlotte Bronte and Emily Bronte writing, you see that they have extended their wish to uh, a plea that... And will realize that women are different by their own right. See uh, Charlotte Bronte writing in Jane Eyre that uh, women feel they have emotions, so uh, we are not sacrificing robots. So she is actually making this plea for the men to realize that they have minds and they have emotions which are hard sometimes. And they are not always meant to abide by what the men say. So you see that Jane Eyre is actually giving up on Rochester. And she leaves uh, Thornfield Hall. And later, when she marries Rochester, she marries on her own terms. The last chapter begins by saying, Reader, I married him. So it's very significant. It's not Rochester marrying Jane, but this time it is Jane who is marrying Rochester. Because now, Jane is a rich woman. She has got a lot of money from her uncle and it is Rochester who is old who is kind of uh, who is old and who is um, pretty impoverished Thornfield Hall has uh, burned down he is blind and then you have people like Emily Bronte uh, where uh, you see uh, Catherine Linton uh, her whole uh, story is a story of a passionate woman uh, whose life is destroyed because she has to give uh, in to the demands of the family uh, and uh, of course uh, a kind of sexual politics is also uh, 
kind of referred here because uh, it is this this very uh, let's say uh the very line that a man for the head and woman for the heart uh, in Tennyson's poem which i mentioned it kind of explains how women were seen as essentially emotional creatures during the victorian period who things with their heart and uh, because they were prone to excessive emotions they were not uh, they were thought as inferior to men uh, and uh, they were thought as inferior to men uh, and uh, they were uh, said to be prone to hysteria and all they were said to be of a weaker sex uh, but uh, in Wuthering Heights you see that it is this very argument which is turned on its head Catherine's passionate nature it does not become her weakness it is rather her strength uh, and uh, over and over Bronte kind of uh, Emily Bronte kind of makes it clear that uh, it, is, it is this force of emotions which uh, since it does not get a proper uh, way to channelize itself it destroys Catherine in return it kind of self destructs itself. Uh, so it is actually being dealt as a force rather than as a weakness and then when you come to George Eliot and all if you read uh, about George Eliot's characters like Maggie Tulliver in uh, the mill on the floors or let's say Dorothea uh, in Middlemarch you will see that women are having aspirations aspirations like Dorothea uh, besides being a small village girl she has academic aspirations but since it's a small village and uh, her academic aspirations are met with uh, let's say scorn and uh, insensitivity uh, and she her uh, entire life gets destroyed for that because she marries uh, Kazaban and uh, who is a scholar but of course he is a bad husband so uh, since Dorothea did not get a good teacher uh, she wanted to uh, get a good teacher in the form of a husband but the problem is that the teacher is not a good husband so she neither uh, fulfills her academic aspirations and her family life gets destroyed uh, and then of course this kind of rebe rebellious uh, tone becomes even more still uh, during the late Victorian period I mean uh, with the advent of something called the new woman fiction where uh, of course uh, women uh, were not allowed to work in the upper classes it was uh, said that it's a matter of prestige for them uh, a working woman was not treated as prestigious but there were a handful of uh, a handful of professions where they could uh, lead life as respectable women uh, like governesses I mean you see uh, Jane Eyre is a governess I mean and Ronty's book The Tenant of Wild, Wildfell Hall and Agnes Grey both have governesses as um, female protagonists and Ronty herself had uh, served as governess for quite some time uh, there are a lot of governesses in uh, Victorian literature uh, and then there was of course the nurse uh, Florence Nightingale is one of the celebrities of this period. I mean, uh, I mean, you can say that uh, Florence Nightingale had been very prestigious in her uh, profession. But my question to you then will be: Did Florence uh, really present herself as a professional, or rather, uh, she was still playing the role of the woman who provides for the weak, who sacrifices her own well-being for uh, the weak and the destitute? Uh, so the idea of the lady uh, with the lamp, it is still the idea of the angel in the house. I mean, Angel in the House is, of course, the name of a poem by Coventry Patmore. Uh, so it, she's still the providing woman. Uh, she's less a professional, more a providing typical Victorian woman. Uh, but of course, uh, I mean, uh, it is Florence Nightingale who uh, made the health system of England much improved. I mean, uh, she's the one who kind of... Uh, uh, I mean, contradicted the miasma theory, uh, where uh, they said that uh, diseases usually happen because of uh, the dirty air, and it is she who began uh, sterilizing uh, and sanitizing the hospital wards, uh, which you see now. Uh, but, uh, and then there were the hat makers, the milliners, uh, the sweatshop girls and uh, the working class women were a special case. They were of course allowed to work. We will come to that later. Uh, but uh, during the late Victorian period, you see more and more women. Uh, I mean, they are uh, showing a willingness to lead this kind of a life, to be a working woman. Uh, and uh, they are 
came a number of novelists like Sara Grand, Mona Caird, who began to write novels where there were female protagonists who read in colleges. I mean, I have told about female uh, women colleges coming up during the late Victorian period. I mean, these female protagonists of their novels, these new woman novels, they will be college educated and then they will be uh, taking up uh, professions as teachers and governesses and they will be unwilling to marry. So this, uh, this truism that the ultimate, uh, let's say, consummation of wo a woman's life or the ultimate aim of a woman's life is to marry, it kind of get criticized in the new woman novels and the men took a lot of offense on that. The new woman novels were, I mean, they were vitriolized in the popular press by people. So that's another story altogether. But uh, what I'm trying to say is the suffragette movement, uh, the women's uh, fight for voting rights, which was going on, the women's suffragette society was going to great lengths to obtain the voting right. But the problem was that Victoria herself subscribed to that patriarchy. Alive, never marry, and who will herself come uh, before uh, the Spanish Armada battle and give a kind of sutter minute pep talk to the soldiers? Victoria was uh, the typical, let's say, Victoria herself was a typical Victorian woman. Uh, when she came to the throne, she was a very meek girl, and she said that Lord Melbourne, her first prime minister, was like my father, and then she was very obedient to Albert and even when Albert died she took care that the names of Albert got remembered in most of the uh, places uh, the most of the colonial architectures built during uh, the Victorian period so that is why you see a lot of Albert streets and Albert halls and Lake Albert and all these places I mean our Albert Hall has now become coffee house of course uh, and there are Albert halls and Albert streets and uh, Lake Alberts in Africa uh, alongside uh, Lake Victoria and Victoria streets so she all and the Albert Museum is there in uh, England itself. So she always took care that her it is Albert who is actually uh, the man uh, in spite of his premature death. And there were uh, I mean if you look at Victoria's pictures, uh, most of the pictures which were circulated in England, she seems to be the typical wife, the subservient wife sitting down. Albert is standing up with one hand on her shoulders and Victoria is surrounded by their various children. And this kind of idea became the iconic pose for late Victorian and Edwardian aristocrats while taking photographs. And it kind of came in the colonies as well. If you see pictures of Rabindranath Mridalini and their family, it is the same pose, Rabindranath standing up. And then if you see a picture of Gyanodha Nandini and Shottanana, if you even see a picture of Mansur Ali Khan Patodi and Sarmila Tagore, it is the same pose. Uh, so it comes from that kind of an iconic pose. It is a man who is standing up and the woman is subserviently sitting down beside him. It comes from Albert and Victoria uh, and uh, uh, I mean of course you will say that there are pictures of Victoria looking up and she seems more to be the subservient wife under Albert and she herself never she herself never went to the colonies you must keep it in mind it was always like the men like let's say Lord Dalhousie and Lord Wellington and others they were going to the colonies and she herself remained at home so it is again man for the field and woman for the heart she remains at home England while the men venture forth in the colonies outside and she is the one who opposed vehemently opposed the women's suffragette movement the voting rights bill and the widow remarriage bill both of them she vehemently opposed so that they could not be passed until she was dead so uh, well that was that for gender we will come back to it when we come to class class of course the victorians were very much class conscious they like to have their classes well petered out there were three classes of course the aristocrats the the middle class people and the working classes the aristocrats were have been i mean well the aristocrats were mostly the Tories. i mean they tried to live in an old world morality pretending that the world is same as it used to be the middle classes were of course the people who were uh, i mean who were actually uh, running the country they were the most influential class because uh, they were the ones who were there in the municipal boards they were the ones who had made their fortune by trade they were the self-made man and the self-made man was a great matter of prestige 
prestige in the Victorian period. Uh, so that is why you see Bounder B taking great pride in the uh, in the let's say the idea that I am a self-made man. That is where the whole idea comes from. And then of course there were the working classes. The working classes, if you read about them in the in Victorian literature, they are generally divided into two classes. Uh, I mean uh, Dickens himself does that. The deserving poor people, like let's say Nancy, people like uh, uh, Stephen Blackpool himself, uh, they are the one who silently suffer. I mean uh, they generally gravitated towards the east end of London, which was uh, very dirty, and uh, it was kind of where the poor uh, lived. Uh, in very destitute conditions. I mean, there were works like Henry May, who's London Labour and London Poor, and then there were works like, uh, I mean, uh, Frederick Angel's uh, Manchester Papers, where they talked about these people. And then again, uh, at the end of the Victorian period, there was General Booth's Salvation Army, so General Booth writing in darkest London, again about these poor people. And then, uh, I mean, shortly after Victoria's death, you see Jack London coming from America, and again writing uh, about these people in The People of the Abyss, another book so uh, they see they are very well represented in uh, victorian literature uh, books and uh, journals uh, and then of course uh, besides the deserving poor people like poor joe people like stephen blackpool there are the criminal classes i mean the criminal classes you see very well in uh, dickens's bill sykes uh, and uh, uh, the criminal classes they spawned an entirely entire new genre of literature and there were all sorts of crime happening. I mean, there were pickpockets and there were murderers. There were people who committed burglaries uh, going into people's houses. Uh, and generally, the criminals were from East London. But uh, it often uh, became apparent that uh, the aristocrats were also paying them for doing crimes. I mean, the aristocrats very frequently went slumming. That is, they went in night to these people and paid them uh, for doing works and of course another kind of criminal class were the prostitutes i mean it's uh, i mean it's controversial but they were treated uh, treated as criminals back then and a lot of aristocrats used to visit them i mean the i mean you if you read the police diaries about uh, the people posted in front of uh, the red light areas you will see the police saying that uh, most of the people who come to the prostitutes seem to be uh, either retired sailors uh, and university students, yes. Uh, so anyway, uh, and uh, it is this criminal class which makes possible the rise of crime fiction because it is this criminal class who commits crime and then the people think that we need a police force. Uh, I mean, earlier there used to be the military whenever any riot or something like that happened, the military used to be called. Uh, even in, I mean, in the Gordon riots, it was the military who took hands into their matter. But now uh, the London people started to think, the government started to think that we need a standing police. So in 1819, you... I mean, you have the police coming up. Uh, at first, they uh, the only job they had was to catch criminals. They were not really expected to do uh, special detective work. But once a thing happened, like they searched for a thief for 10 days, and then they discovered that, uh, I mean, the thief was right under their nose. Uh, and they couldn't even realize that that person was a thief. The thing happened back then was that most of these, uh, I mean, uh, men who were recruited in the police, they were recruited from the village because they had to be able-bodied, strong British yeomen. But then it kind of became apparent that, need, that they need a kind of detection, a, a kind of training in cerebral work as well. Otherwise, these kind of blunders will continue to happen. So then the detective uh, department of the London police came up uh, in Scotland Yard near Thames. So that is where the detective department being named the Scotland Yard comes from. And it was, of course, Robert Peel, a British Prime Minister, who uh, actually created the Metropolitan Police Force or the London Police. So that's why the police uh, are popularly called Peelers or Bobbies back then. Uh, uh, Bobby comes from Robert and Peeler comes from Peel, that is. Uh, but again, I mean, uh, there is always this anxiety that the police are just not enough. So that is where you have the entry of the detective. You see a detective character, uh, Inspector Bucket, in Dickens's Bleak House and then his friend 
Wilkie Collins is writing his first English detective novel, The Moonstone, in 1868, and then The Woman in White, and then of course you have uh, the very very popular Sherlock Holmes by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. So that is where uh, the whole idea of crime and the detective fiction, crime fiction comes in. Uh, so so much about class and then race of course it was very important during that period and of course i mean it was related right i mean we will deal with it again when we deal with colonialism but uh, race was kind of intertwined with class uh, i mean it kind of got for a confirmation from uh, let's say the idea of uh, it got confirmation from uh, the the darwinian idea that uh, the people of other races are less evolved from us so like we are supposed to rule them because we are more evolved uh, than them and i mean uh, among the criminal classes uh, there are some special crimes happened like let's say uh, i mean wt stead in 1885 he kind of uh, created an expose he wrote and a long tract on the system of prostitution in london and uh, there he kind of made it clear that even 10 or 12 year old girls are sold into prostitution and it is the aristocrats who mostly seem to be the clients and then of course there were the the jack the ripper murders in the white chapel area uh, he uh, the mysterious killer he murdered five prostitutes uh, Catherine Nedos, Mary Jane Kelly, and such and such, uh, and uh, the killer was never caught. Uh, he also he was so audacious as to write letters to the Scotland Yard itself. Uh, I mean, the letters began with the salutation, "Dear Boss." and he used to cut away body parts from the prostitutes bodies like kidneys and left breasts and uh, livers and such and such so uh, these were the kind of crimes happening uh, and uh, then of course we come to empire i mean uh, whenever we talk about the victorian period the feature of empire can never be far behind i mean uh, as i said after the british had already holdings in uh, the americas in the west indies in uh, india but after uh, the napoleonic wars it kind of became obvious that uh, they are to be the foremost colonial power so then what people say is began an age of indifference where they kind of uh, passed through an a period of self satisfaction where they were the premier colonial power in the world of course the task of annexation and all went on uh, and there were a lot of commodities coming in for example let's say i mean tobacco coming in from the americas uh, coffee coming in from the south americas sugar uh, coming in from the caribbean and a whole lot of things coming in from india i mean tea coffee spices silk and what not uh animal products coming from africa and australia new zealand also uh, giving them uh, a lot of products so of course america went away from their hands quite early i mean it declared itself to be an independent nation in 1776 but australia was gained it was uh, treated as a penal colony i mean you will remember magwitch from great expectations uh, being sent to the colonies but then it uh, towards the middle of the victorian period it kind of became a place for settlement where uh, people who were uh, not well off in london who needed a kind of second chance they could go there and they could begin a new uh, they could have a fresh start like let's say mr micobar in uh, david copperfield dickens is david copperfield so uh, then you see australia transforming into a kind of settler colony and the same is happening with new zealand itself and uh, new zealand also uh, but uh, what happened after that was that uh, since america went away from their hands this kind of event is called a swing to the east so the british are becoming more and more dependent on the colonies in the east like india australia new zealand such and such but what happened after that during the end of the uh, victorian period was that uh, since the 
Britain was a primary player in, uh, let's say, uh, the manufacturing world since the industrial revolution has happened there before anywhere else, which was pretty much obvious in the Great Exhibition of 1851. 50% uh, of the Great Exhibition of course, the Great Exhibition, uh, the Great Exhibition happened in Crystal Palace in London. Uh, it was Prince Albert's brainchild. Uh, so he wanted all the manufactured goods from across the British Empire being showcased there. 50% of the goods showcased there were from England, of course, France, Spain, uh, Russia and all of them uh, sent their materials, but almost f more than 50% was taken up by British goods. So it was obvious that Britain was the workshop of the world. That is where, I mean, after the Royal Exhibition, that is where Britain gets this title, workshop of the world, because everywhere there were British manufactured goods. But... Uh, the picture started changing during the end of the 19th century because if you read European history uh, back then, it is there in your past subjects, right? Uh, you will see that uh, Italy and Germany got unified. Germany under Bismarck, Italy, uh, Mazzini, Garibaldi and then Cavour. Uh, and then, uh, so these uh, nations, they started becoming industrially advanced. And then there was, of course, the United Nations across the Atlantic. So they had become very much advanced industrially. They were more than willing to be England's competitors. And for industry, you need colonies, because that is where you get your raw materials and you sell your finished goods too. So uh, that is where uh, began a kind of tension. So the English started to become, um, I mean, the scholars say the English started to become a, a little less sure of themselves. And uh, maybe that is why we see the age of new imperialism, where the English maybe feels that there is a need to show that we are still as strong as we used to be. So you see them uh, annexing areas more and more. You see the British Empire being extended to almost 4, million, 4 billion, uh, million square miles. And since the English needed control over the Suez Canal, you see them, uh, I mean, uh, annexing Egypt and uh, General Gordon gets killed in Khartoum and he is treated as a hero. There is a kind of resurgence in imperial interest uh, back then. Uh, and then of course from these kind of tensions, I mean since Germany and the others, they also were willing to get colonies but England was not ready to leave any space for them. And there were ugly happenings like the scramble for Africa and then you see the Berlin conference happening where Africa gets, uh, I mean, divided into 53 parts without uh, any Africans getting uh, getting uh, called in the conference. 13 nations came, but no African was invited. So, and then gradually uh, the tension continues uh, spilling over. And then you ultimately have the First World War and then the Second World War, where it kind of becomes obvious that Britain cannot hold the empire any longer. I mean, they have started giving places dominion status right after the First World War, Australia, Canada, and all these places. And then they started going away. So that's where the empire thing comes to an end. What I will end my lecture with is a kind of a short uh, discussion about what was happening in the late Victorian period because more or less, uh, I mean, I have given enough space to the early and mid Victorian period. The late Victorian period, all those 20 and 30 years, something else was happening. I mean, if you look at late Victorian literature and this is where I'm going into, uh, I'm going right into my thesis. You will see that uh, the late Victorian literature, which are generally the books which we read in our childhood, uh, what was happening there can be, I mean, divided into five dominant features. I mean, there were a lot of reasons. Uh, I have already discussed them. The rise of, let's say, Germany, United States and other powers. So there seemed to be a kind of fear about British degeneration, that the British are degenerating as a whole, as a race. And this also had got, uh, this also, uh, I mean, had got to do with uh, a kind of, uh, I mean, the, the kind of pollution happening in London. I mean, London was nicknamed as the smoke because of the famous London smog and uh, the atrocious conditions in which the poor lived in. And there were more than, uh, one proof that uh, the aristocracy were morally degenerated and they were actually going into these slums to perform 
let's say activities which should not be named so there is an anxiety regarding the physical and moral degeneration of the english which you see in works like uh, robert louis stevenson's uh, dr jekyll and mr hyde i mean who is mr hyde he is the face of english which we don't want to see we want to see the english aristocracy as a respectable dr jekyll and then there is of course a picture of dorian gray where you see the same dorian the aristocrat he has committed a lot of sins and he stows them away in his picture so that is his hidden side and then of course you have uh, works like let's say hg wells's the time machine where you see the english race has degenerated into the eloise and the morlocks i mean um, the, i mean the eloise seem to be uh, the aristocrats who have become weak and the morlocks are the working classes who have degenerated into something subhuman um, and then you have richard jefferson's after art where you see that there is nothing called london or anything the whole place has become a kind of barren land uh, and then uh, there is uh, a kind of uh, 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 this is where race and uh, class and gender uh, prejudice come together you see that uh, in late victorian fiction the male is getting challenged more than once i mean something is coming from the colonies and it is challenging the male and this something can be a racially different thing can be a woman can be a subhuman thing sometimes three at a time i mean uh, something like dracula is coming from the margins and he is launching an attack on the people in the colonies uh, or something like richard uh, richard marshall's the beetle a woman comes from egypt a demon like woman and launches an attack on the english so the idea is uh, if a attack like this comes will the english be able to let's say protect themselves i mean uh, you read henry died rider uh, hagard she it is again an african queen planning to conquer england uh, you read the sherlock holmes stories more than once the problem is coming from the colonies i mean it is gold from ballarat in the boscom valley mystery it is uh, a snake in uh, it is a snake uh, and then uh, the swamp padder and then it is uh, the devil's foot root uh, in adventure of the devil's foot uh, foot it comes from africa it is a kind of serum from the himalayan mood in the adventure of the creeping man it's a disease from brought from sumatra in the adventure of the dying detective uh, so and, and of course uh, i mean in the hound of the baskervilles it is gold, uh, gold brought from south africa and another colony and in uh, the sign of the four it is uh, treasure brought from india from agra fort so anything from the colonies it is kind of invading the british peace and the british are not strong enough to protect themselves they are going into disarray so they need someone like sherlock holmes to protect them uh, and then uh, so now we come to something like uh, the solution there is also a kind of solution so what do you need to do the late victorian writers uh, seem to be saying that uh, you need to like uh, put yourself away from this kind of the victorian urban landscape i mean in this kind of criticism of the urban landscape has been happening in dickens and it is also uh, it was also happening from quite early on in children's literature i mean uh, if you read works like lewis carroll's alice in wonderland and through the looking glass what carroll is basically criticizing is the victorian society uh, when uh, the red queen says that faster faster alice but they ultimately do not move he's actually making fun of the victorian uh, the uh, the great uh, hula value regarding progress uh, and uh, i mean he mocks disraeli he mocks gladstone in through the looking glass he mocks education in alice in wonderland and it is the same criticism of the urban england which is there in late victorian fiction as well uh, because uh, when you see the protagonists of these fictions uh, whenever they seem to go away from england and london and go to the colonies and they seem to be rejuvenated i mean the same thing happens in henry rider hagard's adventure stories that is why alan quatermain his hero does not remain in england he goes to africa to rejuvenate his spirits and the same thing happens in uh, arthur conan doyle's uh the tragedy of the corosco uh, whenever uh, someone is feeling uh the hero is feeling unhappy with himself the hero is feeling lethargic it is the same thing which happens in the prisoner of zenda by anthony hopkins the hero rudolph rasendel is feeling out of spirits in london then he goes to 
it is not the colonies it goes to ruritania which is in eastern europe which is more or less asia he kind of uh, delves into adventure and discovers a new brave man within himself so the colonies seem to have the rejuvenating spirit and uh, i mean that is where you see i mean uh, rudyard kipling's protagonists like kim and mogli they do not live in urban landscapes right kim is a kind of a hybrid character half british half indian uh so he has that kind of the british discipline and he also has the native's ability to be let's say hardy to be uh and the native's uh, ability to put up with hardships so that is the kind of lifestyle which uh, these writers seem to be uh these writers seem to be uh, proclaiming and they seem to be advising uh, the same thing happens with uh, I mean Henry Dyer Haggard's Alan Quatermain, or uh, let's say Kipling's grown detective Strickland. Uh, so, uh, and uh, when we look to Sherlock Holmes, of course he stays in London, but nowhere does we find that he identifies with the Victorian lifestyle. I mean he. does not uh, i mean he is not bothered about having a good life he is not bothered about urban luxuries he is not worried or worried about having good food there are often days when he takes almost no food uh, for example uh, living in dartmoor heath in hound of the baskervilles i mean he remains locked up in a solitary chamber uh, uh, i mean lost in his own thoughts he often does not take money in a commercialized victorian period this is almost unthinkable he does not take money for his case nor does he get any kind of less recognition because his name is not printed i mean again in a media crazy victorian period this is unthinkable so i mean we think that maybe that is why holmes is such a brilliant man because besides i mean in spite of remaining within the victorian society he is outside it so if we i mean of course if we read late victorian fiction there is this definite idea that you need to go out of this kind of victorian urbanity this kind of victorian luxury uh, and maybe that is how this empire can be saved because there are already competitors uh, and uh, what if some invasion or something happens so will we really be able to save our country and if we really want to save our empire we will have to move away from this victorian lifestyle itself maybe that is where the problem lies so you find that it is this very victorian lifestyle being critiqued during the i mean of course it has been critiqued over uh, and again in the early and mid victorian period but what you see in dickens and trollope and uh, let's say eliot's novels is that they are criticizing individual aspects of uh, the society they have not lost faith in victorian society as a whole but it is this faith which seems to have taken a beating during the final years of the victorian period if we read the fiction during that period that is what comes to our mind so yeah that's kind of uh, all thanks for tolerating me for so long that's more or less what i had to say thank you thank you so much uh, dr dipro narayan bhattacharya for sharing your sounds and prolific knowledge on victorian literature uh, we are just benefited by your gracious and kind lecture we are able to look we are able to know different lens through which we can look into victorian literature in particular and in victorian society in general you have already discussed in the uh, you have just uh, classified the victorian literature into several parts and then discuss the the, the the impact of industrial revolution several laws during the time of victorian era that has been passed through the parliament the system of education slave system clash between science and religion role of gender and class in the victorian society role of the metropolitan police and the role of detective agency crime branch the role of colonial power and what not you have and you have discussed the entire uh, victorian society and literature both together in an incorporated manner thanks again dr bhattacharya uh, now i may request to our audiences to ask queries and questions about this particular topic that has been discussed by our honorable speaker sir anyone may raise your question and queries uh, 
Yes, uh, I give a special thanks to Professor Dr. Vikramanand Bhattacharya for his erudite uh, lecture on literary society and literature. Thank you. I, th I think all of us are highly enlightened by your well researched and very very elaborate speech. Just I have one query. Uh, you have uh, discussed Darwin and his uh, theory of evolution. Uh, how Darwin's theory of evolution or Darwinian science, for that matter, uh, is different from Newtonian science as far as the Victorian literature and age is concerned? How it's different from Newtonian? Newtonian science. Newtonian science. Well, uh, yeah, I mean. Uh, the basic difference seems to be that Newton's idea of the world, uh, there was uh, nothing in it where the presence of God could be contradicted. I mean, the kind of work which Newton performed, he always saw it as something which is held the scheme of things better. I mean, when Newton was discovering laws like the laws of motion and the laws of gravity, what he essentially, when he wrote, uh, I mean, uh, works like in Principia and the Optics, he concluded by saying that I'm actually doing God's work because I'm actually finding out how this world functions and these various laws that I am discovering. It is basically bringing into light God's scheme of things even more. I'm helping people to know this world designed by God even better. So. And that is uh, why we can say that, I mean, Alexander Pope writing, I mean, nature and nature's laws were hidden in night. God said, let Newton be, and there was light, and all was light. It becomes possible because of this. I mean, Newton's idea of science did not have anything in it which contradicted the idea of a benevolent God. But that is where Darwin dealt a blow, right? And, uh, because Darwin's idea, it, I mean, by giving all these ideas about man coming from monkey and then uh the struggle for existence and all it very summarily dealt a blow to this whole idea of uh, the benevolent god being on top and he is taking care of all our uh doings and it is only the sinners who get punished uh, and the uh, people who do right they survive i mean then we can say things like i mean then the survival of the fetus does not uh, need i mean if there is a benevolent god then uh, there will all be only be the survival of the moral people, right? I mean, fitness will only be a kind of, uh, let's say, will only be a matter of morality. Uh, where does this idea of uh, survival of the fittest and adapting to the surroundings come from? It doesn't sit well with the idea of a benevolent God looking into the scheme of things. So that is how, I mean, that is why there is this crisis of faith in the post-Darwinian world as well, because uh, that is essentially the area where Darwin science feels the blow. Because nowhere in Darwin's scheme of things is there anything like a god. The idea of a god simply does not sit well with the view in which Darwin was seeing the world. So, I mean, uh, I think that is Thank where uh, is the essential difference. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions from the side of our students? Okay, I in the question says uh, something about something about some gothic writing those influence victorian literature uh, uh yeah i mean uh, gothic writing of course i mean they had a lot of impact on victorian literature right i mean people i mean works like dracula or even uh, let's say uh, the i mean uh, i mean i will say that there is a new kind of genre called the imperial gothic because essentially, when we see the rise of the Gothic, the Gothic deals with the marginal. And uh, in the case of the 18th century, the marginal is the lost medieval past. So that is what comes to the fore in 18th century Gothic. You see, there are uh, old castles and casements being opened up, skeletons of uh, medieval, uh, I mean, skeletons of feudal subjects being stowed away and they are coming out. So it's kind of the medieval returning to haunt. In the Victorian period, I will say, this Gothic becomes the margin coming to haunt the center. I mean, the margin is the colony. I mean, it is, I mean, if it, if in 18th century Gothic, if it is the, the people who have been, uh, let's say, tortured in the feudal society, they are now coming out and taking revenge. In Victorian Gothic, it is the people of the margins who have been, again, tortured by the English people, 
by the colonial masters and who are now coming to take revenge on the masters so if you see stories like dracula it is the monster coming from the margin to feed on people of london if you see richard marshall's the beetle it is a woman coming from egypt a monster woman coming to feed on again people of london if you read uh, rudyard kipling's uh, the mark of the beast which is by the way the inspiration behind shotoji rai's khogom mark of the beast is almost i mean khogom is frame to frame taken from uh, rudyard kipling's mark of the beast it is again a story of the colony taking its revenge on the colonial people please say some features of this era well, that is what i have done for one and a half hours Uh, doctor uh, but yeah uh, i have one question i have one question you just tell me uh, during, uh, <laughs> during post darwinian period just just after darwinian that uh, suppose origin of new species that is origin of new species uh, is uh, it uh, this uh, that is theory have any impact for colonization colonization yes sir uh, i mean uh, that is where uh, the the colors if we think it like this then uh, the colonialists started to say that darwin's idea seems to say that since there are less evolved species who should get extinct this is precisely what is happening in the case of the colonies because the people that in the colonies are actually are actually, actually the less evolved ones so even if they get wiped away from the face of the earth you need not feel guilty for it because that is what darwin is, has said will happen eventually so if the native americans get extinct if the aborigines the australian aborigines get killed off even if the dodo bird gets killed off we need not feel, feel guilty because it is all in darwin's scheme of things they are the less evolved ones and they are the ones who will get extinct and everywhere there will the white uh, there will be the white man who will be ruling the roost i mean uh, there are people like charles dilke who wrote uh, books like greater britain where he is audaciously saying things like i dream of a day when the whole continent will be populated by only the white people so he is actually implying that all the other races will become extinct because they are less evolved that is what darwin has said <laughs> so uh, i hope you have one uh, have answered your question sir thank you thank you thank, thank you, you. Thank you for- Uh, our professor, uh, principal sir, and uh, uh, officially we come to a thanksgiving part of the entire program. Thank you so much, all of you who join with us in this webinar. Thanks our respected HOD sir and principal sir and professor Uttam Jena sir, whose constant and dear uh, and enthusiasm energizes us to organize this webinar into a. very successful way i also thank you uh, to my dear colleagues and friends professor aditi mohapatra professor mohanlal patra professor diganto saha and professor sabanti mal for their constant cooperation efforts and encouragement to make this a grand success thanks subhasda for your technical support and cooperation with us for the entire program by taking the permission from our respected principal sir and hod sir we conclude the program officially here thanks all of you attending the webinar thank you thank you very much okay, thank thanks you thanks for having me thanks thank you thank you for your nice uh, presentation <laughs> thank you sir. thank you it's an absolute honor okay thank you guys uh, thank you thank you thank you thank you I uh,